here and welcome to episode number 12, that's uh -uh, of Dial a Drummer. I'm Brian Stevens. I'm Shannon Corey. And we're just a couple of average drummers with not so average lives talking about really, really cool drum re related stuff. And I almost got through that cool little tag that I'm trying out this week without stumbling. Proud of you. Uh, you know, I try and be a professional. I try. <laughs> But uh, as we get into it today, let me uh, let you know that we are being sponsored by Session Ace. Session Ace is a great new brand uh, that uh, just came out. Well, I'm speaking third person here. This it's is okay. interesting. Uh, so the Session Ace EST uh, in-ears specifically are, uh, are what we're talking about today. And it's an entire in-ear monitor package that uh, sounds absolutely amazing and uh it just happens to be a company that I started, and in-ears are just the very first product that we decided to come out with, and uh, there are going to be a lot of other great drum and music-related products, but um, the uh, Session Ace ESTs are actually the in-ear monitors we're using right this very second. Absolutely. And they sound absolutely amazing out of the box. You also get a ton of other accessories that you need, and uh, they're only 99 bucks. We've been prototyping them for what a year? Yeah, over a year? yeah, about a year. We've been using these things, different variations of them, and uh, you can go get your own set now. Ninety nine bucks. Uh, you get the ears. You get a couple of different types of cables. You get a great. Uh, snappable, closable, water-resistant plastic case. Tons of different ear tips, extension cables, all kinds of stuff. Ninety-nine bucks. It's a great deal. Absolutely. And uh, we appreciate you guys for tuning in again this week on audio and video. I see a uh, Tony Halliburton there that's uh, in the Facebook chat as we're doing our live nice. version. Tony's a uh, he's a user of the Session Ace EST. Yes, he is. He's, he's a lover of those things. Great bass player in town. And uh, I want to remind you guys that uh, we are here every Monday, and we're settling in on 3 p.m. Uh, as our Eastern time, as our start time for our live taping. At least for the next month. At least for the next <laughs> month, until you get some things going, get some things launched. Yes. And uh, you, when we're doing this show live, you can actually call us on that number you see behind us, the 844-833-3786, and we will be taking some calls later, should we have some people uh, on the line. We'll be answering questions about our topic today. And uh, taking your comments, taking your questions. Uh, you can also uh, go to dialadrummer.net if you're not able to watch live or listen live. Trying to be on a production schedule where I, we record on Mondays and we release on Fridays. But um, life sort of gets in the way sometimes. Well, when we're busy working, you know, yeah. some of this extracurricular stuff has to be... <laughs> Put well, it on the shelf yeah, a little well, that's bit. What people don't, they don't realize we do this uh, every Monday and we put it out for you uh, every week because we just enjoy talking about it's, drum stuff. It's a labor of love. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. We want to share some of our information, some things that uh, that we come across. And this week in particular is definitely right out of the pages of both of our lives. Absolutely. And uh, we're going to share, share some very valuable information with you. Uh, make sure you follow us on all the socials. Uh, we're pretty much Dial a Drummer everywhere. We're on Facebook. Well, we're on Instagram, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're still looking for that magic number of 100 so that we can- We need climb. your help, people. Yeah, we need to claim that Dial a Drummer moniker on YouTube. And uh, you can use all of those different modalities to share uh, the show with your friends. And uh, that way you can bring them into this little community that's uh, you right there and us right here having a great conversation about all things drums and drumming. And uh, so with that, um, I don't have any other like newsy, salesy. I think you've covered it all, my friend. I hope so. How was your week? Busy? Very good. Very busy week. Um, some session work and a couple of gigs. Um, pretty standard fare kind of a stuff. Yeah. Some time with the family. Got to see a movie this weekend. That was cool. Cool. Got to see the new Kingsman movie. It was pretty How awesome. Is it? It's very good. The last one was awesome. Yeah, yeah. I would say it's almost better than the first one. Really? Yeah. It's That's a tall order. It's really good. Tall order. Worth seeing. How about yourself? Uh, pretty much work. That yeah. was it. Uh, between my usual stuff here at the studio and uh, some gig things that we're going to talk about a little bit. But today on the show, uh, I had a gig this past Saturday with uh, a band that's got a bit of a, a reputation in town, a good reputation sure. in town, uh, the Mike Veal Band. And going out and doing this kind of kind of run-and-gun sort of private gig, 
uh, immediately raised for me the importance of talking with the people on the other side of the camera about this idea of being a hired gun or subbing on gigs. And so that's going to be today's topic that we're talking about. In terms of why this gig was so important, uh, the Mike Veal Band kind of has a reputation, at least in Atlanta, of um, being one of those bands that some of the best players in Atlanta have, uh, are either currently playing with this band or have filtered through sure. the band. They've been around, Mike's been around a long time. Very long time. He's been one of the busiest musicians in Atlanta. Uh, I mean, he books gigs from uh, clubs to uh, small theater things. I think they're doing like a Greg Allman tribute package oh, cool. now that's nice. pretty cool that they've expanded the band. Uh, and they also do a lot of private gigs. And that's what this was. This was a guy's um, 40th birthday party. Oh, nice. At a really nice restaurant up in uh, Roswell that has a little special events area. And the real challenge of a gig like that is it's all real seasoned pros, uh, guys that are 15 years older than me. Uh, well, I'm 10, 15 years older. I don't want to. I don't to make those guys archaic. But uh, the real challenge of that gig is that you've got guys that know thousands of songs, and they're very good at what they do. Yeah, very good at what they do, and, and they know these songs almost exactly like the album. Right. So uh, they have a Wednesday running Wednesday night gig they do at the Tin Roof, and sort of the running joke there is that you know if you throw twenty bucks in the tip jar, you can pretty much call any tune and they'll play it for you, and it'll be spot on. Yeah, you know I've I've, I've sat there and I've watched people go, "Hey, Mac, you played Josie Steely Dan," and they play the entire tune note for note. Spot on. Right. They'll do peg. Talking about stealing in. They'll do peg, and all the background vocals are there because there's four guys in the band that sing. Like you said, seasoned pros that yeah. know what they're doing. And so uh, it, it's a challenging gig because the set list literally is the American Songbook. It's just what's been popular the past forty years, and that's what you've got to pick from. And it's but it's not unlike any other kind of gig where there's a large song list. And maybe things that you don't listen to in your your casual time, um, so that that really brought me to the idea of talking with folks about what it's like to sub on gigs and and really give people some actionable things that they can do. Uh, I mean, we could sit here and we could say, you know, make sure you show up to the gig on time, and you know, make sure you're nice to everybody and shake the sound guy's hand and. That's all like 101. Right. That's you, common you need, courtesy. You, you need to know that before we even start this conversation. Really? Yeah. <laughs> if, if we have to start there with the conversation, then we probably don't need to have the kind of conversation we're about to have. Right, right. Because we're going to we're gonna dig deep. We're going to dive super, super deep and, and talk about um, the real minutia of what it means to be a hired gun. Have you seen the hired gun DVD yet? Yes. It's pretty awesome. It's amazing. It? You know, Some you, great stories. They, they <laughs> sort of aim it at you know this top-tier touring thing, Alice Cooper and Bon Jovi and things like that. Right. Um, but the sentiment that they have in that DVD really is the sentiment of the hired gun uh, work-for-hire player in the fact that you don't really always have the ideal situation. Um, things aren't always to your liking and you're not always, most of the time, not going to be comfortable, but you still have to be a pro. You have to be able to adapt yeah. with, within whatever situation you may be thrown into. Yeah. You have to, you have to field all of those, all the balls that get hit to you. You have to be able to hit any kind of curve ball. Absolutely. And use a sports analogy and I don't, I haven't seen the first Public baseball game. service announcement. Brian is not a sports guy. <laughs> It sounded good rolling off my tongue, though, right? Uh, really, it's it's it can be a bit of an athletic um, event in the fact that uh, you really have to do a lot of things on the front end to be ready for what happens when you get to the gig, and even then, it doesn't stop. Or even to take the call in the first place yeah. to say yes, you yeah. know. So those are those are a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today, and uh, I'm sure. Somebody on the other side of that camera is asking, well, why would I want to sub a gig for another drummer? Uh, or, or, you know, wh why is that valuable? Well, 
we could start with the drumming community in Atlanta is really cool. Yeah. It's a big circle. A lot of us obviously know each other. Um, so a lot of us trust each other that if we refer one of our buddies or I refer you or likewise, you know that that person's going to step in and do a great job. So mm -hmm. starting there, then you open the door to why do you want a sub? Right. Well, I think, <clears throat> so let's say it's a, your gig mm -hmm. and you've got something else you've got going on and you call me, for example, <clears throat> first rule of thumb mm -hmm. and I maybe jump a topic a little bit here, but if you're going to sub for somebody, respect the job. Right. And go in as prepared as you can, mm -hmm. but don't go in trying to take somebody's job. Right. Well, and, and that's one of the things that I see a lot of times, especially in clubs, and, and I'm seeing it more at networking events now, mm -hmm. where musicians will show up and they have almost a traveling salesman approach to their demeanor. Right. Like every person that I'm going to meet is a sale. Right. Every person I'm going to meet, I'm going to end up with a phone number that next week I'm going to get a gig and this is how I'm going to be able to, to fill up the calendar next month. Right. You know, they're not really looking to build relationships necessarily and they're not thinking long tail. They're, they're almost, it's almost like they're on a, on a safari, on a hunt. And it's about bagging as many trophies as they can get. Well, because it's more about the individual than it does the team that is trying to present something. The first thing in terms of uh, your attitude, you really want to take this attitude of service. You're there to be of service. You're not you're not uh, you're not putting notches on your belt. Right. As you're looking for these opportunities to sub, you're uh, you're not looking to fill the calendar. That's right. not that's And it's not, not about not you mindset. as an individual or as a player. It's about you used a great word about service. Yeah. Yeah, you're really trying to uh, for example, if I need a great sub, you're one of the first people that I'm going to call because I know that you're going to do your homework. You're going to be very prepared. You're going to come in and you're going to make those guys as comfortable as they can possibly be. And that actually makes me more valuable to the people that I work with. Absolutely. They know that if for some reason I can't be there, I'm going to make sure they're taken care of. So you make me look good. Right. And it's also a great way to get gigs because you never know as you're working in a sub capacity or a hired gun capacity who you're playing with right. and who they play with. And if you make a favorable impression, if you know the tunes, if um, if you do all of those niceties that, that are the 101 kind of stuff, then you open the door to other kinds of calls. So instead of just going out there like a, like a safari or a fishing expedition where you're trying to catch stuff and pull it in the boat. What you're really trying to do is opportunities to show uh, yourself of service and prove yourself in the line of fire so that people will begin to trust you. Right. And they will think of you uh, in, in situations where they need someone more permanent. It's a great way, uh, even better than sitting in, subbing is a great way to show people exactly what you can do on the gig. And there was one guy on this gig that even though I've known him for over a decade, we've never actually played a gig together. So, you know, he's seen gigs I've played on. He's I've sat in before on a song or two, but that doesn't give you the full extent. Well, the cool thing is you had a non-playing rapport before right. you actually played, which actually makes the playing yeah. kind of easy at that point. Yeah, yeah, there's a certain level of trust already that, uh, you know, they, they know your track record. They know you as a person. They know that you're there to be of service to them and to help make them shine. So right. there's a level of comfortability there that immediately people, they sort of, uh, they settle in a little quicker on, on things. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to take sort of a before, during, and after the gig approach to the things that we talk about in helping you to understand how to become a great sub or how to become a hired gun. These, they work in tandem. If you're doing one, you're probably doing the other. Sure. This really starts before even, before you get the gig call, this kind of thing starts. And, and I start at choosing my lane. And it's probably the first mistake that most drummers make. Um, you really have to understand first, what music do you like playing? Great point. 
because there's nothing worse than showing up to a gig and if you don't like old school country music like Merle Haggard and George right. Jones there's nothing worse than showing up to the VFW on a Friday night and having to play for four hours right thinking you're going to play blast beats or something <laughs> yeah yeah and 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 yeah i remember when i was in college it was probably before i had an appreciation for that kind of music but i needed to pay rent and so i would show up for these kind of gigs and it it would be dreadful right because for me i didn't really have a connection to the music i didn't really i didn't know these tunes most of the time if i knew a tune i had heard it at my grandma's house and I really didn't have a, any kind of appreciation for the styling and for the subtleties and nuances of this music. And so it really made for a very tenuous experience. Sure. There's a big difference in hearing a song versus learning and playing a song. And when you're sitting in a place playing music you don't like with guys you don't know, the hands on the clock move really slow. You know, a one minute is more like about 25. It's like the kid in middle school watching the clock. It's <laughs> yeah. only... You're just waiting till three. You're waiting till the bell rings. You can go home and watch cartoons. Yeah, so you have to start there. You have to start with what music do you like playing, and and there's some there's some steps past that that we'll talk about. But then you have to take a real honest assessment, and you have to ask yourself what sorts of styles are you really competent with? Absolutely. I mean, we we've both been in positions where we've heard the funk drummer. Uh, trying to play a jazz standards gig, a wallpaper jazz gig. And uh, you know he brings in the, the manhole cover, bright, shiny ride cymbal right. that, uh, you know, that, that's, that's made by companies uh, that don't make smoky, dark, <laughs> uh, wonderful, right. uh, chocolatey ride cymbals that you would normally associate with jazz music. Um, those guys pull up and then they... They play uh, out of con we'll just say out of context for the gig, maybe too loud stylistically. The the stuff isn't right, and it's pretty easy to tell this isn't someone who jazz is their strong suit. Sure, they're playing through the song versus actually playing the song, and there is a big difference between those right. two. It's terms. it's as if it's as if you know I knew maybe a dozen Spanish words and I decided I was going to blow into like the you know the frontera and just start ordering you know I'm trying to impress my date right so I'm going to start using the, uh, <laughs> la pluma and things that you know words that I heard I don't know on the construction site or something you ordered four <laughs> gallons of queso <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly you end up with um, the fish and the eyes are still in it and stuff that just you know it, it ends up going wrong horribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so uh, musically, the same thing can can happen. You uh, you get into a situation where if you don't like this music or you, you're not familiar with this music, you can play in a way or make choices that actually uh, undermine your reputation as a drummer. Sure, and and you quickly not get called back because right. if if it's a for lack of a better analogy here, if you are more of a funk R and B guy and you get a call to go do the prog rock gig. Mm -hmm. probably not the smartest call. You may work yourself up to that kind of thing, right. but if math is not your strong suit every two bars, you may want to work that up before you say, yeah, I can do it, and then get to the gig, and it's a calamity. Right, right. Then you'll never get called back, and it's a small town. The reputation will start quickly. Yep. <laughs> I, I, had, I had a gig early on in my career, like in the late 90s here in Atlanta, where I got called from a, a jazz artist but because I really didn't do my homework about this person before I said yes to the gig, I didn't realize that it was Indian jazz, oh. like uh, not, not feather jazz, <laughs> <laughs> dot jazz. Is that? Uh, I hope that's not. Uh, we're gonna have to cut that we're one taking out. Taking that one out in the edit. <laughs> feather not done. Anyway, it was it was that kind of music where they have tablas and things right. like that, and people do things in nineteen, right. and they're dancing. <laughs> And I and um, you know I got to that the fancy gig. ride symbol didn't help you on no, that gig. No, it didn't. <laughs> and and what's even worse is they had charts for the gig too, and you know my chart reading for that kind of music was not very good. Right. And so I'll, I'll kind of call myself out. I got myself in on a gig that um, I didn't do very good, so I wasn't surprised that I never got a call from those people again. Sure, because I was out of my element. You know, I, I wasn't playing music I was familiar with, even though I could read. I wasn't reading charts in a style that I was familiar with. So it really, it literally was like reading Greek. 
Um, and I, and I didn't bring the right gear to the gig either. You know, sure. I showed up with my standard rock kit and, um, this was anything but that. So you have to take kind of a gear inventory. If you're going to, if you're going to hang a shingle out and be a sub or a hired gun for, we'll just say, uh, jazz quartet gigs because there are a lot of those kind of corporate gigs or uh private party gigs where you're just in a little jazz quartet shoved in a corner and your wallpaper for the sure you don't hours. Need, you don't need to take the 24 no no you don't take a 24 you don't take the 24 inch big clangy ride symbol and all that kind of stuff you uh you really have to be uh you have to take a, an honest inventory of your gear and say what am i equipped to work with sure what are and, the right sounds what? yeah and not every symbol regardless of what the advertising tells you not every symbol is good for every kind of gig not every drum is good for every kind of gig there's a there's a wide enough berth that you can do some things that make them um, somewhat malleable but every piece of gear has its or even the right sticks for the gig yeah you know you don't want to show up to that kind of gig with Two B's only right, when right. you should be taking seven A's, you know? Yeah. So uh, beyond that, once, once you kind of find out what your wheelhouse is going to be, then the, the next mistake that I see that a lot of guys make is, especially drummers, and I'm not sure why drummers particularly are, have this problem, but you have to have a repertoire of songs that you already know. There's nothing worse than uh, getting a call to sub a gig, and you're like, yeah, yeah, great, no problem. I'd Send me your it. list. Yeah, and you get the list, and there's 120 songs that, that you've you, never played. Mustang Sally is <laughs> probably the only one. <laughs> and so uh, part of part of this idea of being a hired gun or a sub for gigs, especially these kind of gigs, is you've got to start early with building a repertoire of tunes. Um, jazz players for decades now have been used to learning standards. Mm -hmm. But with more contemporary music, we have a, a, a standards type of songbook. I call it the American songbook because it's tunes that have been popular for like the past 40 plus years sure. that um, you may have heard them on the radio. You may have heard them on uh, on your parents' radio, on a classic rock station, any number of different places. And uh, so... You've got to start early before you start getting those calls with building a repertoire of songs that you know and not that you halfway know or that you just know the drum parts for. One of the things that I would do is I would start by taking an inventory. Just get a piece of paper and from the top of your mind, what are the songs that you could play beginning to end exactly like the recording? And just make a list. That's a good question, right? And if you end up with three of them, then you need to get a recording of that song and then sit down the drums, put their recording on and play along with it. If you've got a way to record yourself, even better. Right. And then go back and really judge. Did I play the right groove for the verse? If I didn't play the exact fill at the end of the first chorus, did I play something that fit stylistic? Was it fill appropriate? Sure. Yeah. And if there are any band important band figures, did I play those with the recording as if I've known the song and had played the song a zillion times? So, you know, that list of songs that you already know really does help you get a starting place and it helps answer some of those other questions from before when you're trying to pick your lane. And it's good for your individual growth and as your own learning curve. If you, I'm going to jump to one of your notes a little farther down here, you know, like you said in rehearsal, because it starts prior mm -hmm. learning a song a day, I'm going to steal one of your points here, yeah, yeah. but that's a great way to do it. Yeah. Before you know it, you're at three, four, five, ten 10 songs. Yeah. You get somebody's song list You've got a good working idea of some great tunes that you already know. Well, let's 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 get to that point. So the the next thing you can do if you're trying to build a repertoire is you got to find the songs to learn. And what you don't want to do, you don't want to wait till somebody calls you for the gig. You want to go ahead and, and know what are the tunes that I should be learning. And one of the best places you can start is finding out what bands in your area play these kinds of gigs, whether it's club gigs or corporate gigs, uh, wedding gigs, all those kind of things. And most of them have websites. Especially if it's a band you like, you can preempt. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, that's that's a great way to be very specific. Think of a band that you went out and heard at a club that you liked. Or maybe you were at your uh, cousin's wedding, and right. there was a great party band there. You're like, I kind of like that band. Right. 
that was a great set list. Let's yeah. come steal it. I, I mean, guarantee. borrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's one of those. You, know, you meet the drummer, you meet some of the people in the, the band, and you're just, again, establishing relationships, beginning to build bridges. And, uh, you know, you get a card from whoever runs the band, and it'll have the website on there. You immediately go. Most of them will have a song list. And it may not be all the songs they play, but it'll be the 60 most popular ones. And that's a great place to start. You can just, there's a ready-made list. Right. And if you... <clears throat> Sorry. That's the only problem with drinking these things during the show instead of water. Is every once in a while I gotta kinda let one of those go. We've had a couple of good ones <laughs> throughout the series. So you can hit four or five of those websites and you can look at the commonalities. Mm -hmm. Like if you see Mustang Sally on five different band websites, I know it's kind of tongue in cheek with pro musicians, but if you see it on five different band websites and you don't know that song, probably a song you need to learn sure and so you can compile this spreadsheet of tunes based on these different lists and you can just begin to start to knock those out you can ask friends that you know that are working musicians you can uh, talk to someone you're taking a lesson with when, when i started taking jazz lessons with justin varnes i immediately said hey do you have a list like a typed out list of songs that are very common standards for the kind of folks that you play with here around town. And, of course, Justin being a great drummer and a great educator, he immediately went, yeah, hang on one second, went right to his computer, pulled up his spreadsheet, printed off a copy for me, and handed it to me. Nice. And they were even, and this is how awesome he is as an educator, they were even compiled in um, categories like one, two, three, four, five, from easiest to learn to hardest to learn. Oh, wow, nice. So, yeah, and his his instruction was start in the number one category. Here's all the satin doll, uh, all the things you are, all of these jazz standards that are easy to learn. And, uh, and that really helped because sure. here's a working player that gave me a list, and he even went one step further and said, these are the ones that are easiest to learn. I think you could get these pretty quick. And uh, and that really helped a lot. You can uh, just just as you're meeting other musicians and building bridges. Um, there there are um, all kinds of musicians that I'm just friends with. Um, Gary Harris, who's a sax player in town. You know, he's in a lot of these smooth jazz and R and B jazz circles. And one day we were just kind of hanging out. And I said, if I want to come sit in on one of your gigs, name five tunes that I would have to know. Right on. To be able to Good sit question. in and and fit in right, to right. your circle of musicians that you regularly play with. And he rattled off five as if I had asked him that question before. Nice. And immediately wrote them down and I started working on them. Uh, that's the way love goes, the uh, Janet Jackson tune. A song I never would have sat to learn. But because he said that's one that you have to know if you want to convince people that you sort of belong. It's kind of it's a it's standard. It's sweet in, home in that Alabama right. of that crowd. Right, right. And uh, and and so that was incredibly valuable. Uh, he gave me five tunes, and I immediately that week went and learned those five tunes and did the kind of homework we're going to talk about later. And it's kind of, so it's kind of establishing a set of standards with within whatever genre of music is out there. Mm -hmm. You start learning what, what those are, and then you've got at least a good working idea of what to show up and have in your back pocket if you're, like you said, going to sit in to right. start networking early on. Yeah, so, so, sitting in is a, a great way to begin to get these kind of opportunities. Um, having some tunes that are genre appropriate for those kind of bands, super valuable. Um Ask yourself, what songs do you hear on classic rock or top 40 or some of the, the decades stations? Like if you get on satellite radio, there's a, 60, a 50s, 60s, 70s, right. 80s, 90s station. All you need to do is you know, just put that station on for a day. What are some of the tunes that you hear on those stations? Because if it's a song from the 1970s that's still getting radio play from somewhere, probably a popular song. So that's a great way to begin uh, surveying the landscape and building a repertoire or a list for your repertoire that right. you, need, you need to learn. And you know me, man, I'm like super anal retentive about, uh, about this kind of stuff. And so put, a, put them in a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Don't trust your memory. 
And if you put these things, you can put them in a Google Doc or a um, uh, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet or whatever it is that you use. Or even a legal pad. Write it down. Write it down. R write it down. You can go analog. Right. Old school. Old school. <laughs> so now that you've got this you, list. You don't have to back up a legal pad. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, my house burns down, man? Uh, Your computers would have been gone too, buddy. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. So now you got this list of tunes. And again, I'm, I'm all about actionable. What can we do that's actionable? So now we get into what you alluded to before. There's some things that you can actually do that you can build into uh, at least every week where you can begin to knock this list out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one I call a song a day, uh, if you practice four or five days a week, maybe extend your practice time another 10 or 15 minutes. And pick one of those songs off that list. And now with Spotify and Apple Music and all these different streaming services, most of the time those songs are going to be on there. I mean, I, I remember even as late as, um, you know, last year, I would... If, if I got a call for a gig and I would get a list of tunes, there might be 30 tunes on there I hadn't heard before, and I'm spending 30 bucks on iTunes right. downloading those things at 99 cents a pop. That's true. And um, that way I would have them. <laughs> well, now, um, and I did this for Mike's gig, uh, immediately after he sent me the message and said, hey, can you do this gig? I hit his website, and I pulled his song list, knowing it was only a partial song list, but I pulled his song list down and I immediately made a Spotify playlist. And I just cataloged every song on there, even the ones that I knew. Right. I just put them all on a Spotify playlist. And uh, you can do the same sort of thing. Look at that list and every day take an extra 10 minutes to uh, just do a search for one of the songs, put it on this playlist of songs that I'm learning. And, uh, and you sit down and you can make... A quick little drum chart that's got the basic grooves for the verses and the choruses, the form of the song. song. You know, is it an eight bar intro? Does the guitar start? You know, right. love and happiness. There's that lick. Right. And now we're in. So knowing those little touches, those are the kind of things that let people know that you know the song. Right. And so you just make a little note on your card, you know, you write guitar intro and maybe you write a couple of little eighth notes or something. Sure. Uh, whatever the timing of that is. The tempo of the tune, yeah. all these little things. All of the little things that you need to know, uh, the specific grooves for verses and choruses, if they're band figures, you want to make sure that you try and chart them out or write the rhythm for them or give yourself some kind of primer so that as you're playing through, you know it's coming up, and then you know what to play that's complementary to that, that sort of thing. And if you do one of those a day, even just three days a week, now you got a dozen tunes each month that you know. Absolutely. In the course of a year, that's 144 more songs that you know. In the course of that song a day, you're going to run across some tunes that you didn't think you knew, that you do know. So maybe you wedge in two songs that particular day. You know, somebody uh, somebody has Johnny Be Good on their list, and you pull it up, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's got the stops. Right. Oh, yeah, I actually know this song. Great, just put it on the list, play through it, make sure you know it, move on to the next tune. You got two songs done. In it. Right, and at the same time, you're keep, keeping your brain active and, you know, moving forward with your learning process. Too. Yeah. Another thing I would add to the, you could use, you know, it's one thing to write out charts, but I tend to use a lyric sheet because yep. most singers will be follow their form yep. down to the T. Yep. And if you, so if you're on the same page with them, it's a lot easier to keep the band straight. It's the equivalent. You hear, you hear jazz musicians always talk about learning the melodies of the standards, mm -hmm. not just the form of the standard because the forms are pretty standard, um, but, uh, and not just the chord changes but actually learning the melody. It's the equivalent of that. And that's definitely where drummers fall down. You should learn what the lyrics are to the tunes and have a good idea of what the melodies of those tunes are. Um, if someone decides to do a different arrangement from the record, but you know the lyrics, 
then you can follow them more closely. Yeah, it's easier to adapt. If, if a singer doesn't do that extra bar at the end of chorus two, right. getting into the bridge, the little build-up thing, they go right into the bridge, then you can follow them. You know where they are in the song. And it happens all the time. Sure. You know, people do slightly different arrangements from the original. So if you happen to know those lyrics uh, and you know those melodies, you're familiar with not just the drum parts, but the songs themselves, you got a better shot when it, you're in the line of fire on those things to, um, to be able to follow what's going on and what's swirling around you. Sure. Um, so the, the drum charting helps, and it's great for practicing, being able to knock those out, but also learn the tunes. There's something that I do that a lot of people don't really realize, and, and I definitely got some of this on this gig this weekend. Um, a lot of times when we learn songs, we're kind of guilty of learning them just like the record, uh, including the tempos. Mm -hmm. But depending on who the vocalist is and depending on who some of the other musicians in the band are, a lot of times people will do tunes slightly faster or slightly slower than the recorded tempos, sure, especially absolutely. slightly faster. Yeah. Uh, if they've been playing a tune for 15 years. Well, and especially if a song gets the audience going a little yeah. faster, I totally get it. So there's, there's one little trick that I do when I'm learning tunes that's a nice intermediary step. If you use your iPad when you practice, and we talked about apps last week, uh, there's an app called the Amazing Slow Downer mm -hmm. that I actually use it for slowing down and speeding up. So I'll load a tune that I'm learning into that, and I'll slow it down 3%. And I'll play through the song and I'll kind of feel how it feels a little, a little bit, bit slower. slower or I'll speed it up 5% and I'll feel, where does that feel? So I don't really get a muscle memory necessarily for the tempo of the recording. I get a muscle memory for the overall feel of the song so that I can, I've got a little bit of, I got a window sure. that I can go up and down. And on this particular t uh, gig Saturday, you know, there was one tune where the guitar player counted it off and it was a lot slower than I was. It was probably five or six clicks slower than I'm used to playing it, but we were able to lock right in because of things like that, being able to adjust internally and know, oh, okay, I'm not going to fall into muscle memory and we're going to gradually push right. up towards what I'm comfortable with. He's going to count it off. He's going to set that with how he plays, and I'm just going to fall right into it. And wherever the song is counted off, regardless who counts it off, mm -hmm. stay there. Unless, <laughs> unless, <laughs> I, especially if it's a, if it's a, a, a throw-together band, a lot of times, you know, sometimes, a lot of times. Never. <laughs> Well, you, if, you can't move once you start. Well, Come on. If, if a vocalist turns around and goes, I need a little faster, then you can over you can the course nudge of, it, right. yeah, you can nudge it up. But it, it can't be dramatic because oh, then no, all no, of a sudden no, it sounds no, like no, the band is no. horrible. No. Well, that's that's where some of these apps are great. Hey, we got a call right there. Um, that's where some of these apps are great because you can learn to sort of gradually speed things up. Right. And uh, I'm going to take that call that's right there because that's a 770 number. Do it. And uh, odds are that's somebody that we actually want to talk to. So we're going to take a call. We're going to oh, interrupt cool. this conversation and, and take a call here. Let's do it. So let's uh, see who we're talking to. All right. Who have I got on the line? Well, George. It's me, George Sandler. George Sandler. What's going on, George? A regular of the Dial a Drummer bum, program. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> What's going on, boys? Oh, man. How you doing? We're talking. Ch chatting drums, which I love to do. Yeah, man. What's up? Oh, not much. I, I saw that you had your um, thing about subbing and how to do it effectively, and it's yeah. funny because I did that this weekend. Yeah. And I know you did, too, Friday night. Yeah. Or Saturday night. You did it Saturday night, didn't Saturday you? Saturday night. I sure did. He called me, and I and I was already booked, and so I'm glad he got you to do it. So. Oh, man. I, I thanked every single drummer in Atlanta for booking being themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thank y'all. Appreciate y'all being too busy to do uh, this one. I'm bummed out. Oh, uh, your loadout was better than mine, I'm sure. Uh, uh, I, I played a wedding at the Georgian Terrace Hotel. Oh, that's a hard it's one. Terrible. Yeah, you did you, oh you had God. to park over in the parking garage next door and go across, right? Well, no, no. Well, sort of. You load in through the dock, through the loading dock, which is on ponds. Oh. And you have to drive around. They got to give you a badge. You got to have a badge. Yeah. Yep. Because. God forbid you don't have a badge walking through the hotel as a contractor, <laughs> whatever. Don't need and then you drive your car badges. through the parking deck, Yep. get your ticket, go back in, 
set up your stuff, and at the end of the night, you pack up, yep. go get your van, got to have your badge, yep. go through and go back down Ponce and go in the loading dock. This is all after a Georgia Tech game and everything else is going on on, yeah. on Saturday yeah. night in the city. Yeah. The worst. Welcome yeah. to Atlanta. Hour <laughs> yeah. 55 minutes. Yes, sir. Come on in. The worst yeah. fine. <laughs> We're not overcrowded. We need more. <laughs> yeah, just bring your cars. Yeah, absolutely. Come on in. My buddy Rick Hingle taught he he taught me a great thing about that gig. If uh, if you can do it all in one trip, and if you if you, if you do this thing, you know you know how uh, kids will do this thing where like they'll stand in the middle of the room, they'll close their eyes, and they'll go, "You can't see me. You can't see me." <laughs> He's got this great trick where if you just in your mind, you go, all right, I'm going to load it all up on the cart one time. I'm going to go park in the garage and I know exactly how to get from point A to point B and nobody can see me do it. Then I, you can avoid the loading dock thing with that gig. But it's one of those where you have to be quick and you have to literally like, you can't see me. You can't see me. You don't see me doing this. You have to own it. Like, you know, <laughs> or, yeah. You you can't see me. I, 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 don't find the man pushing the big cart with the drums on it. That's, That's right. totally it. Yeah, yeah. Now they'll uh, gripe and complain about you and say that guy will never play here again. But then three weeks later, you're there doing the same thing. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, so you, have you got a tip or a trick you want to share with us? Well, I just think that beyond everything else, I just think you just have to be as prepared as possible. Oh yeah. And I know that sounds, I know that sounds really. Well, well, duh, but seriously, it, it means, you know, and it, it behooves the band leader as much as possible. And I know you got you got your call the very last minute. Oh, yeah. You kind of, you, you, would you get a call on Friday? Uh, it might have been late Thursday, early Friday. Yeah, it was it was very last right. minute. And those guys play everything. Yeah. And so you just kind of have to go in with big ears. But with this band that I was playing with, it's mostly dance music. Right. And, he, and the guy, although... It took him a while because he asked me about the gig two weeks ago, and I said, great. They use some tracks. They use click tracks as this dance music, so there's some extra synth stuff and all that stuff going on. Right. So I said, that'd be great. I, if you'll send me some of the tracks, I'll take care of it. I already have some tracks from when we played together two years ago, mm -hmm. so that'll be cool, but send me a song list. And the song list actually didn't come till Tuesday or Wednesday. Oh, gosh. And some of the songs on there were, were stuff I was not familiar with, so I literally made what I do is I have a um, I use an iPad Pro kind of like you do. Yeah. I make my charts and then scan them to my iPad Pro and oh, okay. go that route. And I, I try to listen before the gigs, make my tempo markings. Uh, it's easier when you're playing, sort of easier when you're playing with tracks because the tempo's there. Right. You just got to make you, you know you got to have everything you got to have to hear it, which makes my job more because I can't just show up with drums. Yeah. I've got to show up with a kind of an ear, ear, in ear rig and so forth and so on. Right, but right. I just think there's no other way to do it but be prepared as much as you can. And then you're almost at the mercy of the other guys in the band, too, because if you, if, like you said, you get called the very last minute. Hey, man, I need uh, the, the latest I've ever been called for a gig was on a Sunday. I got called at 1.45 to come down to a 3.30 rehearsal to play a 5 o'clock service. Oh, wow. During that same day. And it was just, uh, okay, yeah, sure, I'll come down. And, you know, we just kind of read through the stuff and went, went through it. And it wasn't, it wasn't but five songs, but still, you know, you're also dependent upon your band leaders or whoever to give you cues. Right. Um, it, 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 it's harrowing. It, it, you know, what do you bring? Everything and, and anything, if you can. You right. Know? And right. especially with being prepared. There's no secret to it. You just got to be prepared, like you said. I, I don't know how you did that gig Friday, man, or Saturday. That's, they play everything. And I play. I used to play with that band years ago, and I played with them a few months ago, did a whole weekend with them, and each night we did a different set of songs. Oh, yeah, yeah. And in some cases, the guys in, in the band this weekend didn't even actually know the songs. It was kind of interesting to, like, one guy knows the songs, and so at the beginning, like, you know, he, he literally, he'd go like, all right, it's in D, and it's one one six four five, and uh, and then you'd see a big four when it was time to go to the bridge. Like right. Somebody'd hold up a four or something. Well, that's, yeah, it's, that, that, that's the other big thing. It's one thing to talk about being prepared and do all this due diligence, but you got to have big ears and listen. Oh, yeah. And really just big pay like elephant ears, yeah. <laughs> you know, and just pay attention to what's actually going on in, at the gig in real time. Right. 
And that's and that's something we're going to talk about in a bit. But George, we're going to get back to our list. Thanks for calling. No worries, man. Just take care of you guys, and just always always a pleasure to listen to you. Thank Thanks, you, George. We'll see you. Take care, bud. Bye. So yeah, yeah. Actually, some of those things we're we're gonna we're gonna table those in just a little bit. Getting back to what we were talking about in the practice room, there's one other un, other way that. I wanted to kind of table with you that to me makes it an interesting way to go through learning songs is this idea of kind of building drummer case studies. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll pick a drummer that I really like. I've done this with Percaro. I've done this with J.R. Robinson. I'm starting to do it now with Paul Lyme. Uh, yeah. since country is such a big thing. He's now. played on yes. <laughs> yeah. almost a lot more records than some of those guys combined. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I went through my Al Jackson Jr. phase, so sure. I had to play all these Memphis tunes uh, and learn all these Memphis tunes. But I'll actually build a um, sort of a case study mm-hmm. for maybe six months where I'll just study a particular drummer. Uh, Travis McNabb is another one that I'm going through a lot of tunes that he's played on that are also very popular tunes uh, that you might play on a cover band. Gig. Sure, pick up the nuances of yeah, that player, because especially with somebody like that. There's some things that are so specific, like with with Paul Lyme. There are fills that he plays that are very specific to him, mm-hmm. just like uh, you know some of the Motown drummers. Right. Like you can almost tell who the drummer is by that fill. Right, right. Uh, in country music, you can tell whether Eddie Bears played on something or Paul Lyon played on something or uh, Milton Sledge played on something or Lonnie Wilson played on something by some of the fills that are there or the way that the grooves are constructed. So a lot of times I'll take a window of four to six months and I'll just be learning tunes that I n- know a particular drummer played on. And it makes it, um, makes it more interesting for me in learning songs. Because there's kind of a common theme between all of them. Sure. Other than, well, maybe I'll get a country gig that I get to play these songs. I'm actually learning the vocabulary of these great uh, recording drummers so that uh, I can use them. I can use that vocabulary to sub on gigs and all, and also use that kind of vocabulary in the studio to make better decisions about what I play on somebody else's track. So that's just just another technique that you can do in the practice room. As far as prepping for a gig, so let's let's say um, you've gotten the call mm-hmm. and you already know a bunch of songs and you've already done some homework on this stuff. Somebody, but somebody sends you the set list. What's um, what's the next thing that you do when you know that the gig is on a calendar mm-hmm. and you have a song list? What are what are some well, things that you do? You already mentioned putting it in a playlist, whether it's on Spotify or Napster or Apple Music, whatever you're using. For me, when you get into let's say they send you sixty songs and you haven't done forty of them before, mm-hmm. I'm I'm gonna go make me lyric sheets, okay, and try to learn that form really quickly. Yep, make my little notes on that, mm-hmm. so at least I have a really good running idea of where the singers are gonna go. Right, because at this point. Not necessarily writing out a drum drum transcription. Right. You know, I might write out the the figure or the setup to the chorus or whatever. But for the most part, we're going to have a good idea of what we need to play for the song. But if you're in tune lyrically with the singer, especially if it's a vocal gig, Mm -hmm. that's where I'm going to focus on. Right. And then just start working on it. You got comments? While we're talking about stuff, yeah, Tony Halliburton was saying that he uses an amp called OneNote. It's a number system for guitarists and bass players. Nice. That's great. I know in Nashville, the number system, even for drummers, is super important. Uh, Jim Riley's got a great book that on a good that. Book. A drummer good. who put a book out about melodic stuff. Uh, and about how the Nashville system works and yeah. how to learn it correctly. Right, right. And if, if you have got some basic ear training, sometimes, especially in talking about learning the song, a number chart is better if you've done some ear training and you know these... Um, chord sequences and what they sound like mm-hmm. you know what does a one six four five sound like versus a one four five or what does a, a minor chord sound like versus a diminished chord uh you know these different kinds of things those kinds of um, melodic charting systems may be super valuable for you uh in learning a song and knowing your place sure. in the song so, but even yeah. with a numbered chart you still got to Sit down and listen to the tune because oh, it's yeah, not giving yeah. you any rhythmic information. No, it's not giving you any of you that know. stuff. Anything is super specific. So doing your research is important. I usually ask if a band has any kind of show tapes. Um, with with artists that are doing original music, I almost always get some kind of show tape. Sure, because the recorded version of tunes is 
is very different from the live version of And that's a good, that's a question I'll ask lead, band leaders a lot of times too. Are you referencing a record version? Yeah. A YouTube live video? And if right. so, does everybody <laughs> know what that is? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and YouTube is a, another great one because most bands that are working nowadays have some kind of YouTube presence. Right. So, you know, if, you, if you're going to sub for John Child on the Rupert's Orchestra gig, there's a lot of video, even if it's just phone footage right. of Rupert's playing tunes, you know, playing the new Bruno Mars tune or whatever. You can dial it up and playlist that on YouTube and actually get some recordings of the band playing that they may not even have. Right. So you can do a little bit of homework that way and uh, begin to knock out some of the specifics that you're going to need to be able to sit in and sound like you belong in there. Well, and like you said, doing a case study on drummers, if you know the drummer's been on the gig forever, mm -hmm. learn some of his nuances so that yeah. you can go in there and be seamless and the band can relax and right. they're not thinking about, oh God, how are we going to get through this? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, uh, you, you also have to kind of ask if you're doing any kind of charts, whether it's drum charts or number charts or lyric sheets are you going to use paper on the gig are you going to be uh you know 21st century and use an ipad uh or are you going to memorize them and some bands don't allow any of that right, right. you got to come in cold and know it all i'll jump on my one of my own points uh during the gig sometimes uh, you have to do a very good read of whether or not you should pull out your charts. This gig I was doing Saturday was, even if I had charts for all of those, the one thing I didn't do today was grab some charts out of there. Right uh, that file cabinet is full of charts from the last 20 years. I got charts that I did when I was in college and learning tunes. That's the other thing on this topic, right? If you, so you take the time to make these charts or whatever your workflow is, put them in a notebook or a PDF, Excel spreadsheet, whatever, and keep them because yeah. you do one gig. Okay, so you maybe you don't play with them because their normal drummer goes back on the gig. But when you get another call, you've already got a nice working idea yeah. of what they're doing. And then it's easy to recall all oh, that yeah. stuff. Yeah, usually I can remember if I've done songs on a gig before. And if I have and I've done charts for them, they're usually going to be in that file cabinet. There's one whole drawer of the file cabinet that's just... Uh, either charts I've written or copies of charts that were given to me sure. or any number of different things. And slowly I'm digitizing everything so that I've got it on a hard You have drive. the version of Brick House in seven? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I don't. Thank goodness. It's epic. Uh, it's epic. <laughs> It's, they were so savvy to do that. Um, so yeah, you, you need to organize your charts. If you're going to use paper, maybe you're putting a notebook together with sheet protectors or whatever, and uh, maybe you got set lists ahead of time. Ask for those things if the band has them. Um, and decide how you're going to organize that information. Or if you're not. Uh, I already knew this particular gig. The read on it is always, nobody's using charts on this. The other thing on this topic too, set list. Find out... Is the band running actually running a show on a set list, yep. or are you at the mercy of the singers just calling it out as he oh, feels it? Man. And that's that was, a whole nother that conversation. Saturday. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> talk about flying by the seat of your pants. <laughs> um, click or no click. That's that's one because tracks, um, no tracks, yeah, yeah, right? Tracks, no tracks. Click or no click. Every gig is different. Um, you really need to find out what is the drummer doing that's normally on that gig, and you want to follow suit. There's nothing worse than you go running in there with your rhythm watch and your setup, right. and the drummer that's on a gig doesn't use any of that. Your whole idea in subbing a gig versus, say, just being a hired gun, if you're just subbing a gig... The whole idea here is you want to be as close to what they're used to as possible. Right. Even if that makes you slightly uncomfortable, <laughs> you want to do things in a way, in a manner that's very similar to what the rest of the band is used to. What right. does that drummer do? And maybe you have a metronome with a light on it and you've got some tempos programmed in to jog your memory. But if that drummer doesn't play with a click... I'm probably not going to use a click on the game. Sure. I may use the little, I may use my Get your uh, count tempo off. Sure. app and I'll have the light and I'll have those plugged in and I'll use it as a reference to start. But then I'm listening to the band. Uh, decide if you're going to do that or not. Uh, maybe if 
the setup that you're working with is very different from the setup you're comfortable with. Um, I, I know you have a setup that is your normal setup, mm-hmm. uh, but I tend to morph what I use to whatever the, the gig is. guy is, you know, whatever the guy normally plays that gig, what he uses or as close to I can, as I can replicate it as possible. Uh, especially if there are a lot of specifics like electronics and clicks and sure. all that. Like I'll put together the, in there's, there's one artist gig that I've done a lot of work for the last year that I haven't gotten the sub call yet for it. You know, I got asked at a certain point, Hey, could you be ready to sub this gig? Right. That was a year, year and a half ago. And I did, I've done a ton of work to know all those tunes to get show tapes uh, when right. they're available, to make charts based on album versions and show versions. And I've actually sat up drums that are like the guy that does the touring gig just so that I can be ready when the phone happens to ring. Right. And believe me, it will ring if they ask you, hey, could you be ready for this? Sure. It's not something that I just go, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Oh, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, hey, great, wonderful. I'm on it like tomorrow. I'm working on the, it. The other thing I'll do, I'll also ask, is there a percussionist on the gig? Yeah. Because that can also affect what you need to take or not to take. Right. Because then you're not having to try to cover all those parts as well. Right. And then sometimes it's fun to call that person and find out, are they a true percussionist or a drum set player playing, playing percussion, percussion, which is two different animals? Totally. You know. Totally different. So let's talk about getting on the gig. And, and like I said before, we're kind of foregoing the whole show up on time and be nice to everybody and wear the right clothes. And Yeah, or, or making some assumptions that you know some of the go-to yeah. goes without saying kind of things. There are plenty of other podcasts you can listen to for that discussion. We're getting <laughs> we're getting into the deep dive The meat. Here. So bringing the right gear to the gig. We've talked about all of that, but making sure. I, I took one chance this weekend in that I brought a kit that had a 24-inch kick drum. But I knew the room that we were going to play, and I knew that the miking for the drums was going to be minimal. So uh, just kind of knowing the instrumentation, knowing that kit, and knowing that it would play well in that room, Mm -hmm. I brought my Steve Verone USA Customs with the 24-inch kick drum. sweet kit, buddy. Dude, and it turned out to be the right call because, you know, the bass player immediately, uh, Tommy Vickery goes, man, that kick drum is amazing because and and he he pinned it what that kick drum is so great about it sits in a place in the overall band mix that's perfectly where a kick drum should sit sure in terms of the amount of the attack and the low end in that it stays out of the bass guitar like I'm hitting frequencies with this kick drum that stay out of his way. Right. It actually makes it easier to hear the bass guitar. I mean, come on, that's a winner right, right. there, right? So don't everybody go buying a Steve Ferrone <laughs> kit now. That's my little secret. I gave it to you, but watch, there's going to be 12 guys in Atlanta now that buy those dang yeah, kits. 24 is just sold out. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great sounding kit. There's a reason why Ferrone uses it, and that's one of the reasons. It just, for a live band playing classic rock, R&B, like the kind of music we were playing, it just sits in the right place live. And those for keep that are keeping track, it's a standard. It's a 14 by 24? Yes. Yeah. yeah that's the, the that's depth. the money sound. Oh man. That's the secret of that. It's yeah. the 14 is depth. It definitely is. Uh, and th- one of the reasons why I picked it too, I only have two kick drums that have 14 inch depths. Uh, and one of them's a vintage kit from the fifties. I'm, I'm not carrying that out for a gig. No, I knew this was going to be a shallow stage. Sure. And even though it's only two inches, you know, some people use an, like my, my Brooklyn kit. It has, um, an 18 inch depth on the kick. I knew it was going to be a shallow stage. That two or four inches makes a huge difference. Yes, but you have to remember, you and I are both over six feet tall. Yeah. There is no shallow stage where we're concerned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, well, we, yeah. We when take you, up real estate. When you hire a tall guy, <laughs> yeah, you kind of get what yeah. you get. But I knew, like, the, right, short, sure. the 14 inch depth is perfect for those kinds of. Hey, there's Darren Stanley on, uh, on the line. He just jumped on the, the live webcast. Oh, cool. Hi, Darren. Man, amazing drummer, yeah. dude. Nice guy, too. Um, that 14-inch depth, I knew it was going to be a shallow stage, gave the singer a little bit more room to run, kind of stayed out of his way a little bit. That There were some reasons why I did that, but you want to pick the right gear. Well, it's uh, also, it goes into listening and playing to the room. Yeah. You know, having the right tools. Right. And- as far as bringing gear to the gig, 
uh, for me, I tend to bring two or three different snare drums. Mm-hmm. What do you do with the gear that you choose to bring to a sub? I'll generally bring two. Yeah. Um, I, I'll have my main, which is yeah. generally a seven by 13. Yep. And I'll bring a five by 13. Yeah. I like the 13s. You're a 13. I, yeah. I, I, I know everybody loves 14s, but for the drums I play, the trick drums, the aluminum. Yeah. To me, those are the, and I've got them tuned in such a way that they can cover whatever I need. Sure. <clears throat> Uh, for me, I brought, for this particular gig, I brought my five and a half by 14 Vinnie Kalayuta snare. You know, nice. It's just a USA Custom that's branded a signature drum, but it's just a five by 14. Sure. Gretch. Um, I also brought the um, six and a half by 14 Black Beauty. Just knowing the tunes that I was playing. Sure. I, I just kind of felt like, even though I don't always carry it out on gigs, I felt like it would be a solid choice for a slightly deeper drum. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, I packed an Acrolyte. Like, that's one of those things. If you're trying to do the sub gig thing or the hired gun thing, you can almost carry an Acrolyte to any gig. Can't go wrong and with aluminum. And it's probably going to work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Says the guy who plays <laughs> aluminum drums. Uh, that's one of those where if I bring two snare drums and I'm thinking, oh, one of these two will get it, and I happen to play in a room where neither of them work, I can pull out that Acrolyte and this one I brought had the diecast. I put diecast oh, nice. on it, Warms just because I, I like that bit. sound. I like that sound. Um, but uh, yeah, so had the Black Beauty not been the call, uh, the Vinny one. It just even though it's a great sound of drum for that room, it was just a little shallow. Mm-hmm. It didn't have quite the the meat I thought I'd need against the weight of the band. Um, the Acrolyte would have worked just fine. And so yeah, two snare drums plus an Acrolyte, you're gonna win every time. Yeah, so there, there you go. Uh, go to eBay and buy one for hundred bucks. I, I usually carry different symbols. Absolutely. Like I, I, I carried three different crash symbols, knowing I was going to hang two. So uh, I knew two of the three would always work. And then I carried a fourteen and a fifteen inch set of high hats, and two different ride symbols. Mm-hmm. So gives you enough variety uh, based on what's going on. Yeah, that's just being safe. Sure. That's a lot. That's not so much the style of music because either one of those would have worked for the style. It was the room. Like when I got in the room and I hit that twenty inch crash symbol, I went, ah, nah, that's too gonna much. Be too much for yeah. this room. Uh, so I had two different 18 inch crash symbols that had different pitches and different sheens. I could hang both of those. That was perfect. Uh, with ride symbols, um, the one I normally go to is a 22 inch ride symbol. That particular 22 works in so many different situations. It was a, the perfect ride symbol, but I had a slightly smaller one just in case. Sure. And, uh, same way I, I like the 15 inch hi hats. They don't always work. And in this case they were perfect, but if they hadn't, I'd pull out the 14s. Bob's your uncle. You're done. Right. Just having some choices. It, it's easier to cart it and leave it in the car than to leave it at home. It's always better to have more gear with you yeah. than wish you had something yeah. that you just decided not to bring because yeah. you were lazy. Uh, one thing that I, I do before the gig actually starts is I always ask about a set list. In this case, I already knew. I knew those sure. guys. There is no set list. Yeah, they're just calling. They're them. calling teams. Yeah. Uh, but if there is a set list and you if you know it's a and you don't already have the set list, do you guys already have a set list worked out? Uh, great. Can I see a copy of it? That way you can, if you've got charts, if you've got tracks, if you've got other things, you can kind of make sure your order's right. And then ask lots of questions. Yeah. You know, when you're subbing, especially, maybe not so much as a hired gun, but as, as a sub, I think more questions are better than less questions. Absolutely. And ask ask for help. Hey, can you yeah. send me a cue? Hey, let's I, communicate. I'm always about like, show me the stops. Yeah. Drummers, look up. <laughs> look <laughs> yeah, at yeah. your bandmates because y- you will see a cue somewhere from some person. Yeah. You know, and v- conversely, the drummer, we can, we cue a lot of things. Yeah. If everybody's paying attention and watching and listening, man, I, I it makes always, life much easier. I always ask, who am I going to look to for cues? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, is it going to be the guitar player, the bass player, or is it going to be the singer? And sometimes I'll get a definite answer. Other times it'll be just watch everybody. And so you're using your peripheral vision right. and, uh, and kind of looking at the landscape of things. But I also kind of uh, help people with common hand signals, stops. 
build it in. I tell singers, build it in the show. Like, show me the style. Right. Zun, Give like, me the singer. <laughs> or the hold. Right. Like this, the hand behind you like right. this. That's the hold on a second. Or we're going to the top. Yeah. You know, top. Yeah, right. yeah, you get this a lot. The top of the tune. Uh, got that a few times with, from the guitar player. Sure. Going to the top. Uh, and just paying attention to those things, which brings me to the most important point. Like, you've done all this thinking. You've done all this preparing. You've done all of this work that gets you in order. And you're already kind of nervous. In my case, I'll be honest. Like, these are some of the best musicians in Atlanta and have been for decades. Absolutely. Even as long as I've been doing this, I was a little nervous. Sure. You know, and these are guys I've known for a while. I just, and I'm not nervous because I don't think I'm going to do a good job or not nervous. I'm just nervous because I want to make sure that, um, that they're comfortable. Sure. But if it's also a gig you haven't done in quite some time yeah. or haven't done ever, yeah. you're going to, hey, we're all human. You're going to be a little nervous. That's okay. Yeah. You want to be in the moment. Mm -hmm. That That's the whole point of this. Like you've done all this prep work. It's easy to kind of stay in your head and, you know, worrying about the whether or not it's the right groove and whether you should stick with that fill and is this happening with you and that when you should be present in the moment. That, yeah. That's where this mindfulness, like letting everything go and just being there, this very Zen kind of. Yeah. Once you, once you count off there. the tune, you got to be in the moment. You got, right. you kind of forget about all the peripheral yeah. and just play music. Cause that's at the end of the day, what it's really about is playing music and listening to what's going on with everybody in the band right. and enjoying the moment. Cause yeah. if you're so tense and you're like, Oh, I can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> then it's like, you might want to be a, Bank tellers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you probably. Well, no offense to bank tellers. Yeah, I know, no, but you might. You, it's one of those where you might learn the groove a particular way as you're doing your prep, and maybe the bass player plays that a little bit differently. Sure. If that's the normal bass player for that group, then that's the right groove, not the album groove. Right. So if you're listening, after the first bar goes by and you played what you thought was right, and you hear him do something different. If you're listening and you're in the moment, you immediately know to change. Sure. You immediately you kind of know. learn how to push and pull with mm -hmm. whatever said player yeah. you're playing if with. If you syncopate the groove because it's sync you know, the it's the end of two on the record, but he plays a hard downbeat on three, then I'm only gonna do it one time. Right. Because the next time that bar comes around, you're gonna get a hard three. <laughs> I might ghost in a little and of two just to keep the feel there. Or just because I'm wondering if maybe he does it as a two bar phrase, right? But um, I'm definitely going to uh, to follow his lead there. In the case of guitar players, if the recording has a certain kind of swagger to it, and I start in that swagger, uh, there was a Beatles tune that we did that kind of started in what I felt was the swagger for the tune. But I listen, I'm listening to the guitar player. I'm like, yeah. It's not totally like the recording. So within about a bar or two, I just kind of loosen up my feel a little bit and um, and adjust what I'm doing to match what I'm hearing. Sure. And that's part of that being in the moment. And uh, one of the greatest compliments that uh, I could have ever got was on the uh, on the break. You know, Tommy, the bass player, came up and he said, man, feels great, man. Gee whiz. He's like, it's it, we're, we're just coasting at this point. Nice. He's like, and, and he made a point. He said, you do the thing that most people don't do, which, which is if we come up on like a band figure and you're not sure about what it is, um, one of the tunes we played, Countryside of Life. For whatever reason, I couldn't remember the band figure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I played with Jimmy Hall. I made a chart for it. Like, I could not remember the band figure. Sure. He said, you do the thing that most drummers won't do, which is you'll play something that's totally kind of vanilla safe that will work and listen to what we do. Like, you let it go by. Right. And then catch it the next time. And then time. catch it the next time. And, and that's one of the things about being in the moment is if there's something, maybe they're playing a song you don't know. Instead of cramming in a fill that you think <laughs> needs to go there. <laughs> no, you play something that's very safe, that keeps the time moving, and maybe you shift what you're doing a little bit because you see where the figure's going. So it sounds more like a groove fill sure. as opposed to a fill fill, right. like move around the drums fill. And you're just listening. You're you're developing this ability to hear something 
and immediately give it back. Sure. That's one of the great things about uh, this kind of work in the practice room is that you're learning to hear all these different rhythms and eventually you can kind of intuit, you hear something and then you can pair it back pretty quickly. Well, it's kind of like the secret to, you know, to figure like that where mm-hmm. you don't, you're not sure instead of coming out on like a hard one on a crash, yeah. just stay on your, stay in the lane, don't hit a crash. Yeah, you so don't you have, come out yeah. soft and then, like you said, the next time around you nail it and they're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and they're 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 too helping your case about knowing songs. Um, sometimes when you're doing this deep dive study into songs, you'll notice tendencies like, oh, that drummer in that song doesn't hit a crash going into the verse. There mm-hmm. may be a reason why that is. So if you build that into what you do, it sounds more like you knew the song. Sure. Uh, or there's been a few tunes I was listening to over the. 24 hours that I had to get ready for this gig um, where I noticed things like there's a lyric where there's a crash on four with the snare drum that goes perfectly with the lyric. Right. Not something you would do Normal, just in sure. the case of a song. Right, right, right. But in that song, that particular it's space. a very important figure. It, it tells people that you know the song. Right. Sometimes you you sort of put it in the, the old file cabinet and it just sort of sits in there. We we did the uh, Tom Petty, Don't Do Me Like That. Mm-hmm. All right? So it's funny because I go to count the tune off, and I'm like, there's something in the intro that I'm supposed to remember. I know there's something in the <laughs> intro of the song I'm supposed to remember. And for some reason, my mind just, I'm like, I heard the song yesterday. I've heard the song a gazillion times in my life. I don't know that I've ever played it, but I know the song. Right. I couldn't remember what it was. But again, being in the moment, having that zen calm thing, you know, counting up, one, two, three, I hit the first note with the crash and heard the chord, and I immediately went to the the next part of the figure, which is, uh, uh, did I do, uh, uh, did I And I was like, holy cow. Right. Like, I consciously, I did not know that I was supposed to do that. But in my subconscious, because, you'd already worked it out because I'd already I'd heard the song enough times in my life. I'd actually heard it the day before and kind of made that mental note, like don't forget that that intro goes that way. Sure, like it came out of my subconscious immediately. And what happens if you're paying attention and you do the right thing, and then everybody's face lights up sure. with the smile, like he knows the song. You immediately settle everybody into this, okay, now we're going to play the song. Right. Everything's fine. Brian knows this song. Gee whiz. It's all about, it's all about listening. I mean, yeah. Because also you can be in a situation where, let's say a, a bass player, for example, some bass players tend to be a little funkier. Some tend to play more on a rock side. So yep. that can kind of change the vibe or the feel of a tune. Yeah. And you got to be able to shift a little. Yeah. You know, but that comes down to listening. You're not going to be able to figure that out on your chart or right, right. having done all this listening to the recorded version. Well, somebody goes to play a Buddy Holly tune, and if you try and play it like, you know, serious kind of rockabilly kind of thing, maybe they're maybe they're a little more modern with the feel sure, sure. of it, you know? Or maybe they're doing a Dwight Yoakam tune, and it's not quite so uh, alt-country. Right. You know, y- you make those decisions right there on, on the deck while things are happening. If you're listening... If you're in the moment. So you got to keep your eyes open. You got to keep your ears open. You got to look and communicate. Sometimes, and sometimes people make little subtle moves. Can it, like, no. <laughs> don't ever do that again. No, <laughs> duh, duh. no, not that. Not that. Don't call us. We'll call you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want this. <laughs> not the signal you want to get. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, it's one of those things where uh, sometimes as I'm playing, I'm watching, I'm watching people's faces, I'm watching their eyes, I'm I'm looking at their expression to see tr- kind of where they're where they're at, and if they're in the music or if they're having to think too much. If they're mm-hmm. having to think too much, I'm probably doing something wrong. Um, I'm also looking at hands, like if I'm wondering whether or not to syncopate something. Or I know a band figure is coming up and I want to make sure, like, you know, I've gotten to the point now where I can play my drums and I have to look at them. So out of my peripheral vision, I can look at a keyboard player's hands or I can look at a bass player's fingers and I can see 
as I'm playing that they're either playing something complementary to what I'm doing and I'm I'm in, right. or I'm about to do something that's not going to work. <laughs> right. Yeah, and and I've got to very quickly shift into something else, something that works. So just pe- being completely aware, eyes, ears open totally so that you can shift. Now, do you record yourself for every gig? I've gotten more in the practice of that, yeah, I mean, with a little Q2 in. Yeah. It's it's a nice reference because you, then you can go back and see what, right. you know, like on the gig sometimes you're like, oh, man, I was feeling that. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go back and like, oh, I was so close. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, but uh, not so much so. Uh, hey, we got another caller on the line. It's a 678. Let's see who's on the line here a second. Oh, who do we have on the line? You should know my number by now. It's Brandon. Hey, Brandon, what's going <laughs> what's up, Brandon? on, man? Well, I was sitting here watching you guys, and uh, one of the things that I'd like to add is with everything you're talking about, just understanding how music works. Yeah. Um, I've taken so many last-minute gigs that the, the leader look turn around and say, hey, play the song. <laughs> right. If you know how music works, you can always follow along. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, it's funny because on that gig in particular, like somebody would look at me and go, uh, how about this song? And my answer all the time is, sure, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, you're going, what the heck did I just oh, get myself into? Oh, man, I'm scrolling <laughs> through the Rolodex real quick. I'm going, what's the lyric? What's the, what's the guitar riff? What's this? What's that? Like, I'm, I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling, 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 scrolling until I hit on something. Right. But yeah, the answer is always yes. And... There are little questions you can ask, like, where do you like it? Right. Like, you're, you're saying tempo. Like, they think you're asking, where do you like it tempo-wise? What I'm really go- trying to get them to do is I'm trying to get them to sing a piece of the song. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they may sing a piece of the song for a second that jogs my memory. You mean you don't go, hey, how's it go? <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> well, I'm even getting into the aspect of you don't even know who the artist is. Because right. I've had oh, yeah, yeah, turn yeah. around and, and this can be hard to imagine, but hey, do you know who Zach Brown is? I'm like, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we went into it and there it was. <laughs> but that was uh, right when Zach Brown started hitting, so I didn't know who it was. Sure. And part of that, like you said, is just kind of having a nice working understanding of music and being able to listen and, and adapt on the fly. On a last minute gig, you, you don't have prep time and you... And, and certainly, hopefully, the people you're playing with understand there, there might be a little leeway and that they're cool, and you hope they are good at cueing. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And sometimes uh, that lands you a gig because maybe you're on that particular gig because their drummer flaked yet again. Right. And if you can come in and they say, hey, do you know X song? You're like, no, but play it. I'll put something to it mm-hmm. that's going to fit. Right. That'll put you better in... Uh, better standings with that particular band. Right. That's a good point. And, and sometimes people will know if it's a pretty stock tune that doesn't have stops and all kinds of weirdness to it, um, sometimes they'll know to sing you a groove. Sure. Like, and, or they'll tell you the kind of groove it is, like if something's a shuffle. Right. If you don't know the, the that particular blues song, they just go, that's just an up-tempo shuffle, it's fine, I'll show you the stops. Then, uh, then that's all the information that you really need. And, and some of that you can do in the, in the pregame. You can kind of tell somebody, look, if it's a, if it's a song you, that you want to play that I don't know, it's pretty, pretty straight ahead. Just tell me what the groove is and we'll go. Show yeah, me the stops. Just give me a little information. We're yeah. good. Yeah. I would have loved to have had information on that. Yeah, he, he literally <laughs> was singing and turned around and said, you know chicken fried? Like, what's chicken fried? <laughs> <laughs> it's only a number and one hit. Know, <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, at the time, it had just uh, yeah, it was kind of brand new. The star that he is now, right. um, and that's not the ne- that's that's not necessarily the easiest song to have to f- try to play. That particular song, Chicken Fried, especially, um, that's a song where it's easy to tell whether or not a drummer has heard the song and learned the song because it's and it's not just the stops yeah like that last verse with the military snare thing right. and when things are halftime versus when they're more of the straight ahead two beat kind of thing or where where the where stops it comes are in even when it comes in yep yep that cut time part completely changes the groove of that song yeah, yeah absolutely yeah it, it, that's one of those where if you're doing the homework of knowing what what the popular songs are of the day uh and and, and you're trying to pay attention 
you're probably going to you'll probably catch that if, especially if it's been if it was a hit last year then you may be able to end run that a little bit by by going and doing that that study but yeah if it's a, a newer tune then yeah sometimes you're just kind of in a hole and trying to get through it the ultimate winging it yes yeah, sir man. thanks for calling in brandon all right man y'all have a good one you all too right. buddy thanks Bye. that kind of brings up a good point too is asking you know whatever band leader <clears throat> are you playing these jukebox versions meaning to the t yeah or do you take some leeway and and can we relax a little bit, you know, just in sometimes that can help soften the blow a little bit too, especially on a last minute gig like Brandon's talking about. Yeah. 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 It's asking somebody, is this the album version or you want to do a gig? When is it right now? (laughs) (laughs) I needed you 15 minutes ago. That's right. So as far as recording myself goes, um, I try and record myself most gigs, but I'm also cognizant of when it's appropriate and when it's not. Like this gig, Agreed. It's kind of, it kind of wasn't appropriate to throw the camera up on there. Uh, there are some gigs that I can throw three or four cameras up, and people are totally cool with it because sure. they kind of know that's the thing. But um, you, you sort of just have to ask. I mean, there's some subtle ways that you can um, go through and um, kind of hide the recorder. Sure and do some things that give you some kind of archive. But if I'm not able to record myself, then uh, all of a sudden I find that I'm kind of earmarking things mentally, like Countryside of Life and right, right. Uh, ARU. There was an ARU tune that we did that nobody ever really does like the album version. And so I had to... Um, Let me guess. So into you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nobody ever really does it exactly like the album version. So I had to kind of make a mental note like... All right, I've done it with a few different groups of people, and I've had to learn a few different ways. How about I go back to the album version right. and kind of recalibrate? All right, so after the gig. Yes. And uh, this is probably, to me, this is as important as any of the stuff before, because um, where I find, at least with students that I've had or, um, or guys that don't seem to have as much success um in either the sub world or the hired gun world, uh, a lot of guys, when they're done with the gig, they're kind of done with the gig. Right. They tend not to think about it anymore. Uh, For me, it starts for me on the drive home. Of course, during the gig, I'm always listening and watching and kind of trying to pay attention to how people are to make sure I'm doing a good job or not. Right. Uh, But on on the drive home, I'm actually sort of debriefing myself because everything's fresh. If I wait till tomorrow morning, then I'm probably going to miss some things. So for me, one of the things that I'll do is I'll just turn on the memo, the voice memo on my phone as I'm driving home, and I just talk through the things that I remembered. And as many things as I mentally cataloged, either songs or figures or uh, a particular feel on something or a vibe I got or whatever it was, I just kind of do a total debrief on that so that uh, maybe tomorrow or next week I can go back through that voice memo recording and write all those points down and then have a punch list. Mm-hmm. Let's go back and hit. I can go back and I can I can – Uh, try and straighten out things that will make the experience better the very next time. I'll go back uh, either the next day or a couple of days later, and if I made a recording of the gig, I'll listen to it. Sure. And especially if it's a day or two later and and I sort of sloughed off what I remember about the gig, I tend to be a little bit more objective about it. I'll go back and I'll listen to that recording, and I'll make some honest evaluations about, did that feel right? Did I do the right thing there? Uh, in the case of some gigs, if I'm doing the right thing and it's not coming off right, I'm listening to other people's parts. Mm-hmm. I'm going, okay, well, yeah, maybe the bass player didn't, not this particular gig, but there's a few gigs I've done in the past where I've actually had to go, oh, wait, you know, the bass player's not doing the right thing there. You're fine. The reason it sounds weird to you is because the bass player should have been walking forward there, and he wasn't walking forward. And so you just kind of have to go through and make those notes and know what to change and know what you were okay on, but maybe it was somebody else's issue. At least in people that I've taught, I'm surprised at how many drummers don't play songs in their practice time. Sure. So to go and learn songs for a gig 
play the gig and maybe even have a recording of you playing the song so that you can make an honest critique of what happened. To not go back and replay that stuff in the practice room to me seems like a huge gaping hole in your uh, your strategy. Sure. I think part of that comes with experience, though, and having done it for a while. Yeah. You know, because some kids are like, oh, I got to the gig. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> you know. The check cleared. But that's the difference of why you eventually start getting more callbacks. Right. And, and, you know, maybe eventually landing that gig if the original drummer decides to move on or whatever. Right. Right. And invariably, that's what I, I know. I've had that happen on different gigs where I might sub for a drummer, you know, five or six or eight or 10 times. And, you know, six months later, he gets the call for another gig and he's got to give that chair up. Going back to one of our original questions, why would you want to sub gigs? Mm -hmm. Because it opens the door should someone else's situation change. I mean, usually, the guys that get calls for gigs are the guys that are already in the camp. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just a loose association, you've subbed a couple of times and it, it turned out great. Right. It's the same thing about guys that get hired gun gigs. Um, nobody's going to call you out of the blue. Unless you have this incredible reputation in your community, no one's going to call you out of the blue for a hired gun thing if you're not in their circle. Sure. There's a few artists that I would love to play with that I'm just not going to get that call. Right. Unless I restructure my life to become a part of the circle of people that generally play with that bank of artists. Uh, and I may not be able to. My life may not be built in a way that I can do that, that I can adjust my whole social circle to be a part of that group. Mm -hmm. um, so people are going to call who they know and who they've had experience with. To that end, one of the most powerful things I think that you can do, and you have to suss out your relationship to the people you're working for, but most of the people that I work for, I'm able to call them back after the gig. Absolutely. And you should regardless. Oh, yeah. Well, and it, just at, least, at the very least say thank you for having me exactly. on the gig. Well, you, you always should follow up and say thanks for, for uh, putting the me on the gig. Sure. I really appreciate it. I had a great time. What that also does is that allows you to keep that line of communication open. It, this is a relationship business, and this is about how you get along with other people. Absolutely. And if you're just kind of putting notches on your belt or you know pelts on the wall or whatever, then that's probably a, a step that you're going to forget to do or that you're going to skip. But it's one of the most valuable because – it continues the dialogue. It continues to foster rapport, but it also gives you an opportunity. You can ask them, hey, is there anything that I could do to make things better for the next time that you need a sub? When you create that environment of transparency, where you give somebody the opportunity, and I tell them, I say, I appreciate you guys telling me how good I did, but it's okay to tell me what I can fix. Mm -hmm. So feel free to shoot holes in anything. If there's right. something that really needed to be improved, tell me because I'll go and take that information and I'll go back and I'll fix it. So the next time you call me to sub, it won't be an issue anymore. Right. You know? And you, you hope that people will go, well, no, it was fine, man. It was great. It was awesome. But there's always one thing. It might be something as simple as, uh, you know, sometimes a little loud. I don't get that much, but some people may, you sure, know, if sure. you ask that question, somebody would go, yeah, sometimes it's a little loud. I mean, other than maybe just kind of watching the overall dynamic, you know, just keep it, keep it reined in a little bit. Or, yeah, I think you could play louder, actually. Right, right. Said no one ever. Yeah. <laughs> or there was this one particular tune where we had this band figure. Go, maybe go back and look at that one. Right. Go back and look at that one, tighten that one up a little bit. When you create this environment for transparency, I find at least... It encourages people to tell you the information that you need to do a better job next time. But it also takes your rapport with someone to a completely different level. Agreed. So much so that they want to call you right. again. Don't just get paid and be like, see ya, I'm yeah. out. You know, it, stick around, help the other fellows load out. It's such a rare thing in this business that people go, no, really, I want you to tell me where I screwed up. Right. I want you to tell me how I can do a better job for you next time. What would it take for me to get another call? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Not, and, a, and a lot of people might be 
scared to ask that question. Right. You know, because they don't really want to know. Right. You, know what I mean? <laughs> you have to have thick skin. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you have to realize it's not a personal critique. Because at the end, it's not about us. It's about no. trying to be the best team player we can be. Exactly. You're trying to be the best you can possibly be for the people that you're servicing. And to be able to do that, you have to have dialogue. Yeah. And I just find that people, it's such a rare thing in this business that people are that truthful and that transparent and that willing to accept the information that comes back at them, that folks on the other end of that conversation actually want to call you more mm -hmm. because they go, that guy, I can trust him. Right. That guy is here not for himself, but for us. Right. That guy is here. Because yeah, ultimately we're trying to make the band sound better, yeah, not yeah. the band listen to the drummer. Right. <laughs> So I, I just feel I feel like that's that's a great last step. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't put a bow on things. What it does is it actually sort of opens up a whole other door, so that you can get to a, a new level. Keeps with the, the circle of communication going. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and people appreciate that. I think they do. So, man, I think we've given people a ton of actionable information today. Absolutely. And it's not just be nice to everybody and learn the sound guy's name right. and stuff like that. Shout out to Alex, who did a great job on uh, sound this weekend, by the way. Nice. Uh, Shout out to Bobby Mobley. Uh, I love Bobby, man. He was so, he's so awesome. It's uh, it, it, That guy's great. The thing about playing on a gig like that, and I just I, we'll come out of the lineup and I'll just say this. The thing about playing on a gig like that, even though it's kind of high pressure in that you never know what's going to get thrown at you, all those guys are such sweethearts. And they just want to have fun. Right. Like they've played, they played enough gigs in their life that they realize that, yeah, they can play. They're still playing music. They're yeah. playing it for the joy of music, not because you can read your chart perfectly. Right. Yeah. You know, they, those guys are there because they enjoy playing music and they've played those songs enough that if anything, they're hoping this will be fun. You know, there's nothing to prove. There's you know no statement to make. It's just about making good music with each other, something that feels good on stage and that translates to all those people out there so that hopefully everybody's dancing. Even if they're sitting at a table, they're kind of grooving in right. their seats and stuff. You want that from folks. And with a group of guys like that that have been doing it so so long, that really is the end game. And and I love that. It, it, it's, it's as pure as it can get at mm -hmm. that point. So... Um, I appreciate Brandon and George for calling in today. Absolutely. This is great. We're getting more people that are calling as we're doing stuff. They're, people are kind of people getting People are paying into attention. That. We appreciate yeah. that. They're getting into that modality. And uh, I want to remind you guys to uh, hit dialadrummer.net. Uh, we're catching, well, I'm catching up on the recording stuff. You, if, if you got a gripe about, as I'm opening up the line of transparency here for people <laughs> to criticize me, if you, uh, if, if you're a complaint about dial of drummers that we're not consistent, uh, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll take the hit for that one. And, uh, we're going to catch up back episodes, uh, at dialadrummer.net over the next couple of weeks. So you'll be able to get nine, 10, 11, and 12 here very, very soon. And, um, so make sure you uh, share it with your friends, follow us on social. Uh, by all means, if you have a question or you have a comment, you can email us at dialadrummer at gmail.com and you can, uh, you can chime in on all the stuff that we're doing. And while you're going different places, make sure you go to dialadrummer.com slash EST so that you can pick up on the Session Ace EST in-ears deal that's 99 bucks for a complete uh, in-ear monitoring package that's all the stuff that you need to get great sound in your ears. We use them here on a show. I use them on every stinking gig. And there are a ton of guys now that they've been out I'm for sale. To get for out there, month. absolutely. There's a ton of guys out there that are using them. That absolutely love them. So uh, make sure you go hit that link and uh, support the thing that keeps this podcast afloat. We appreciate it. So uh, guys, go out there one foot in front of the other. Just uh, take one step at a time to be a little better today than you were yesterday. And uh, just go out there and keep being awesome. We'll, we'll see have, you next time. Have fun doing it. Yeah. Later. See you guys.
just so we can see the comments. All I'm right. going to try not to look at it, though. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, hopefully, we got a few friends that are that are uh, tuning in right now. Uh, let's see. <coughs> Is there me. anything I've forgotten, Shannon? I don't think let's so, buddy. Do that for now. Okay. All right. So let's uh, hit the title plate there. Look at that, man. Look Beautiful. At that. Nice. The majority of the people that are watching don't even know what Western that came from. <laughs> I love it. Uh, I was going to put Clint Eastwood or, or John Wayne, but I thought that's too obvious. You know, let's let's go for the the real Western fans. I'm, I'm all about the hardcore fans <laughs> of anything. Right? If you're hardcore, like you know the the intricacies and the nuances of most anything, that's really who I'm trying to align myself with. The the people that are freakish about it. We're going for a niche audience. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, speaking of going for a niche audience, let's uh, let's fire this bad boy up here. <laughs> 